Gauteng Premier David Makura and his command council warned recently that hospitals could soon reach full capacity as the number of COVID-19 related admissions were increasing rapidly. Gauteng has recorded more than 361,000 cases and over 6,900 deaths. For the latest picture in the province, I'm joined via Zoom by the Wirtz professor and a senior scientist at the Itemba Labs, Professor Bruce Melado. He's also um, you know, a member of the Gauteng Premier COVID-19 Advisory Committee. Professor, a very good evening to you and a warm welcome to the Globe. Thanks for having me. Well, Prof, there was concern that uh, the end of the holiday season will see a spike in cases as people return to the province for the holidays. So what are we seeing at the moment? Uh, right. So um, at our press conference that we gave together with the Premier, uh, we laid down uh, what we think is the situation in the province. Indeed, uh, we have been experiencing an increase in the number of cases, which we uh, think is partially due uh, to the fact that a significant number of people uh, have uh, returned and continue to return from places where the virus uh, is active and based on a number of calculations uh, driven by uh, mobility indexes provided by data providers. We were able to estimate roughly how many we will uh, expect. That was done already uh, earlier, sorry, uh, around uh, December time. And indeed, certainly some of that increase has taken place uh, as a result. Well, a few months ago, Professor, there were question marks over the data coming out of Gauteng and opposition parties in the province have been very quick to slam the provincial administration as being ill-prepared to deal with the second wave. Just how reliable is the modelling that the province is using to stay on top of the COVID-19 situation in the province? So as a committee, we get access to uh, uh, what is now a, a wealth of data that not only includes... Um, active cases of recoveries, mortality, but also uh, includes things like hospitalizations, how they're distributed geospatially, different types of hospitalizations, uh, mobility, rates of positivity. There's a lot of data that we actually get hold uh, of, and uh, it's basically very difficult to miss or mischaracterize um, the picture and where we are in the pandemic based on the wealth of data. Sometimes data is imperfect, uh, sometimes data may come a bit late, but when you take a look at the wealth of data we have, which is not just the number uh, of positive cases, we're able to uh, provide uh, an informed um, uh, picture of what's going on in the province. Well, as part of this modelling, Professor, it was found that uh, there are those who are infected but are not able to transmit the virus and there are those who are infectious but not necessarily ill, uh, the so-called asymptomatic group. So should special attention be given to this particular group? Right. So as we know, uh, most of the, uh, the people that get infected are asymptomatic. That's a particular characteristic of the pandemic we deal with, and that's of course embedded uh, in, in the modeling. So what we do is we basically try to get as much information as possible from different medical sources um, uh, as to what would be the fraction of people that are asymptomatic and the fraction of people that are symptomatic, and those things are embedded to the best of our knowledge uh, in the modeling. So that's certainly taken into account. Professor, is it possible to determine the values of the transmission rate uh, in relation to the to, uh, I would say, to the efficacy of the intervention measures. Right. That's a very good question. So we measure and calibrate the model in terms of that efficacy that you just mentioned uh, on a regular basis. So uh, we uh, update models every two weeks or so as soon as we have sufficient amount of data or we have evidence that there's been a change in the trend or a change in the efficiency of those non-pharmaceutical interventions, we basically what we do is we recalibrate, we obtain new uh, parameters from the data, and then we readjust uh, the modeling accordingly. So basically, essentially, that effect that you are alluding to is embedded into how we model the pandemic in the province. We certainly cannot be having this uh, conversation in greater detail without uh, analysing and interrogating the efficacy of the lockdowns, as we we'll know, as we, we all know that we are already in level three lockdown. Uh, is it really effective in trying to curb or bring down the rates of infection? And as, uh, as I've been reporting earlier on, is that we are now sitting at about twelve thousand uh, infection rates. That's compared to about twenty thousand that you've been seeing in the past few days. 
So uh, already uh, during the time of the press conference last week, sorry, this week, early in the week, in, on Tuesday, we already illustrated that indeed level three has had an impact. Uh, had in level three been reinstated, we uh, would be in a very different place today and calculations have been made uh, to illustrate the fact that that's the case. So now we have sufficient data to uh, indicate and to conclude that indeed level three has had a significant and positive uh, effect. Now in regard to the numbers we just alluded to, that's basically coming from the last week, what we do uh, before we conclude or we arrive at a, a, a particular conclusion in regard to where we are with just a week's data, uh, what we do is we uh, get together, the committee gets together, we have a meeting tomorrow, um, where we not only look at the number of positives, but we also look at the geolocation or where the cases are, where the hotspots are located, and also the different hospitalizations, the trends in hospitalizations, mortality, and excess mortality in order to understand where we really are in the pandemic. So uh, the numbers you are, you, you are giving clearly are going to be studied very thoroughly in the next uh, few days in conjunction with other data before we can conclude anything about a possible change in, in the dynamic of the pandemic. Well, Professor, it suffices to mention that, uh, well, no country knows the actual accurate picture of uh, the exact number of people who are infected with COVID-19 because we solely rely on the data that has been provided as a result of the testing and the testing capacity of the different centres in South Africa. And uh, somebody uh, earlier on asked me uh, how the government determines the recovery rate because after recovering, people don't normally go back uh, to the testing centres to... to uh, to indicate that they've actually recovered. So how does the government or how do the authorities arrive at the figures when it comes to recoveries? Right. So essentially what happens is that there are standard procedures uh, that allow uh, government and other stakeholders to come up with an estimate of the recovery rate. Um, there is a formula that allows a government to determine how many people are estimated to have recovered given the expected uh, time that it takes for a person to recover from the um, uh, from the virus. So uh, you, th you should think about that number as a guide uh, that basically tells you uh, roughly where we are in terms of how many people have recovered. Um, and uh, But then, of course, when it comes to modeling, we look at uh, a, a deeper picture uh, that has many different dimensions, has many different parameters and many different uh, pieces of information that we piece together in order to arrive at a comprehensive view of what's, happened in the, what's happening in, in the province. So we not only rely, of course, on a number or, or a figure of merit, but rather on a very large number of data that is available to us as a committee. Well, Professor, I'm going to have to put you on the spot for a second there and ask you, you know, how long does immunity last after infection? So does that perhaps uh, change the figures of infections uh, after a, a, a person has recovered and is now immune to this virus? OK, so uh, th there is a lot of debate in the, in the medical community. There's a lot of papers that we read uh, as a committee. There's a big debate as we speak right now uh, in trying to determine and establish uh, basically uh, how long will a person be immune or what kind of immunity does a person um, uh, acquire as a result of having had the, the virus. So we're clearly obviously compiling that information and when uh, we feel that that information is widely accepted in the medical community, we try to embed it into the, uh, uh, into the model. Professor Bruce Melado, uh, uh, the senior scientist at the Temba Labs at the Wurz University. Great chatting to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.